Welcome back to the Wingspan Podcast, episode 12. I'm Doug Barrack, joined by my co-host Chris Mahalan of Nets Daily and our special guest. Our guest directs content and does media relations for the Big Three Basketball League while hosting the Positionless Podcast. We welcome Oliver Maroney to the pod. Thank you for taking some time out of your night to join Doug and I. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be on the Wingspan Podcast. I like the name. Uh, I like the co-host so far. I like the host. I think you guys got something going, and I'm uh, I'm excited to be here. Appreciate it. Thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. So first, we, we start off this kind of scheme with every one of our guests is, can you talk a little about your journey to where you are today? Uh, can you include kind of what college you went to and your first sports media position or internship, kind of that first job that got you into what you're doing today? Ooh, uh, yeah. I mean, I think the job starts before the college or the school. Um, so uh, I was in uh, middle school, and uh, I was not a very good basketball player. People know me; uh, I'm not good at basketball. I, I'm just not. Uh, I, I would We've love to that say that I am, but I'm guests. not. I will go to your local 24-hour fitness and be the guy that sits in the corner and waits for the basketball to come to me. And if it doesn't come, you know what? I'm okay with not missing another shot. I'm okay with not taking that extra shot. I'll let somebody else do that. Um, but no, I, I enjoy playing. It's just I'm not very good. And so uh, I wanted to cover the game of basketball in some way, shape, or form. And the Oregonian, my local paper, uh, it's probably the biggest paper in Oregon, uh, had some openings for high school reporters, high school uh, sports reporters. And I wanted to cover basketball. So it was at the time where Kevin Love and Terrence Ross and Terrence Jones and a bunch of guys that ended up being in the NBA for either short stints or longer stints uh ended up playing and so i was lucky enough and fortunate enough to get one of those positions um they paid me five dollars it was to cover literally the entire box score of every game so i would sit there and check the box that says block steal point assist you name it i was tallying it up on a on a spreadsheet that's basically what my job was and then at the end of the game i would send in a game report um, and it would basically be like a paragraph about what the game was, the summary of, of the game, and then the stats. And I would get $5, which would pay for my ticket into the high school basketball game. That was my first gig, and uh, it was great. I loved it. I was like, you know, obviously much younger than everybody else there, but it gave me a real opportunity to meet some incredible individuals and people a lot of family members, uh, a lot of basketball players that ended up being very good. And, um, you know, when you're there at that early stage in their life, they don't forget you. You know, they, they remember where you were. They remember who you are. And you, uh, you were there Kevin. before their quote unquote glory days or whatever you want to call it. So uh, that to me was that was that was my start. That was my first gig. And, um, you know, you can scoff at the fact that I didn't make a ton of money, but that was what I loved to do. And uh, I was willing to put everything on the line to make it happen. And from that point forward, I mean, that was really middle school through high school. It was all about sports like uh, basketball. I played soccer in high school. I played soccer um, for one year in junior college um, and was good enough to do that. My father's from the UK, so I've got a little bit of tie-ins there, but like ultimately I loved watching basketball. That was my passion. That's, that's the sport I loved. Gr grew up watching, grew up wanting to play, but was never good enough. And so um, that was my first gig. And, and like I said, moving forward through that, it was um, something that I just kind of evolved in. I, I paid my way to summer leagues. I paid my way to all-star games. I paid my way um, wherever I possibly could while working on the side to – um, essentially pay for my hobby. And that's what I looked at it as. It was my hobby. I enjoyed doing it. And uh, if you enjoy doing something, uh, you should be willing to shell out some money, in my opinion. Um, and to the point where, you know, maybe I did too much for a lot of people, but it was something I enjoyed doing. So I wrote free articles. I wrote for my own site. I um, commented on things that I felt needed to be commented on. And then slowly but surely kind of worked my way up with uh, Basketball Insiders, Dime Magazine, Uproxx, and uh, now, you know, I was covering the Big Three and uh, got worked into the fold as a as a full time employee with the Big Three now. So I've been working there a few months, and um, you know, I've I've been a part of the league for three seasons. Just this is now my full time deal. So 
Um, yeah, very, very fortunate and uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of care and, um, happiness along the way. You know, I, that's, it's, it's what it is. I enjoy doing this and, uh, it's still, you know, I got to pinch myself every morning when I wake up to say, wow, I'm really, I'm doing this. So. Yeah. And then one common theme that I've caught on to, especially with a lot of the guys that we interview and the guys that I talk to in the field, including myself, we had Christian Winfield on the pod as well was kind of paying your dues when you come into this field. So a lot of guys think, at least from outside, they think, oh, you're on camera, you get paid a lot of money. Oh, you get to cover these athletes, you probably get paid a lot of money. But that's one common theme is that when you start out this field, you got to pay your dues. That's one thing that's in your field. So that that story that you just told about getting that $5 to pay for that high school ticket, I could definitely relate. That, yeah, I mean, Christian, uh, Christian and I go way back too. I mean, I, sorry to cut you off, but Christian and I used to work at a, a website called about.com. And uh, obviously that, that website is no longer a website, but we used to cover basketball for him. And we used to come up with article ideas, me, him, and actually, uh, believe it or not, Kevin O'Connor of The Ringer. Oh, wow. So us three used to work at about.com. I think this is in 2015 and uh, covered the NBA or covered a specific team. I think he was New York based and uh, Kevin was Boston based. I was the uh, just MBA, general MBA. And, uh, you know, we got paid a little bit, but we all love what we did and we covered basketball and that's what we did. So, um, yeah, Christian, great dude. And, uh, definitely someone that I've, uh, known for quite some time now. That's a great yes, story. Yes. Cause I remember when Christian hopped on the pod, he talked a little bit about, about.com and, uh, the roles he did there and how it was no longer a site as well. But just kind of transition a little bit. Can you talk about, because at least in my personal experience, one thing that's very impactful, especially kind of the climb that I've had and kind of progressing in the field is kind of following mentors or role models. So can you talk a little bit about who are your role models and if you have any or any mentors that kind of taught you the ropes? You mentioned that you worked with Christian and Kevin, but is there anyone that kind of sticks out as someone that's kind of always been there from the beginning or really helped you progress in some way? Yeah, there's a lot of people, but I, I would say like, there's probably four. Um, and, and they've been there since the start, really. And, and like, I think the first one I think of when I think of somebody who really escalated my career, helped me when they didn't necessarily need to. Um, Kristen Ledlow of uh, NBA TV and, and, and TNT. Um, so she had just, I think she had just gotten or she was going to, she was about to get the... Um, uh, let's see here, the, the job with, uh, inside stuff. So she was just about to be named the host. And before that I went out to summer league and I, and once again, I paid my way to summer league and, uh, spent four days or so with her just shadowing her, just seeing what she did, how she did it. And she was kind enough to let me see it all, you know, her notes, uh, how she did things on the broadcast, everything. And so I think when you look at um, what is what people typically do in this field and what she did and what she allowed me to do, um, it's not that much different, but she allowed me to do it. You know, I, I think that's the most important part. And when, you, when I look at Kristen as a person, she's always given back. She's always helped out when uh, when the person is right. And I, I still, to this day, ha- want to ask at some point, and, and we'll have to do an interview at some point with her, just uh, why she gave me the opportunity, because she could have given it to a hundred other people, other people, but she gave it to me. And uh, it was really, you know, I'm sure she's done it more now uh, since that point, but to give me an opportunity and, and people just don't understand like how much time and effort and energy that means, you know, that means she's taking me aside and showing me her notes and she's explaining why she does the job she does. This is time out of her day in her schedule, in her life. And basically, I mean, I'm not going to say I was a stranger, but an acquaintance, essentially, um, to be able to do that, I think is really, really uh, it, it, it shows who what kind of person you are. And I think uh, her initially um, I think of Ben Golliver of Sports Illustrated. I mean, he, same thing, Summer League. And, uh, you know, he used to work with the Blazers a little bit um, on Blazers Edge, one of the, the, like, you know, fan websites. And um, he used to, like, edit pieces of mine, show me things, talk to me about specific players, uh, what he thought. He would always be gracious enough to be on my podcast when I was getting, like, five listens a podcast. 
like the it's just those sort of people that um, they see something in you that maybe you don't see in yourself that I think are really, really um, unique and special. And so, like I said, uh, Ben Golliver, Kristen Ledlow, CJ McCollum of the Portland Trailblazers. I mean, CJ and I, uh, right after he was drafted, basically had a little bit of a relationship and um, we did a few interviews and he would send me notes like grammatical errors and things that were in my articles and at first I could, took it as criticism. I'm like, man, this guy, he's really particular. And then I, I thought to myself, I said, I guarantee you it's because he cares. Like this is, this is different. This is, you don't see many people, um, you know, go out of their way to do that sort of thing, to, to send grammatical errors, to meet me outside of his locker room because I didn't have a media pass. Um, these things just change the way you develop as a person and you see things. And I think, Every time somebody asks me to do an interview or a podcast, I want to, you know, I want to do that. And I'm not Kristen. I'm not CJ. I'm not any of those people. But for those people to help me along the way, it made an impact on my life so much so that I want to do the same to whoever wants it. And um, I think the greatest piece of advice that I ever got, I think, was um, probably I mean, there's a ton of great advice that I've gotten. But one of them that really stands out to me is Amin al Hassan of uh, uh, ESPN. You know, he uh, at, once again at an NBA all star event kind of pulled me aside and he said, your greatest strength or the, the, the thing that people will remember you by is your last piece, your last story, your last article, your last podcast. So when people say like, oh, just put it out quantity over quality or whatever, um, you know, that really made a dent into my career and what I thought of as what was good work and what was great work. And every single piece after that, I remember thinking to myself, is this the piece I want people to remember me by? Is this the story uh, that makes the most sense? Do Can I edit it? Can I change it? Can I do something to it to make it even better? Because this is the last thing people will remember, will remember me by. And so that stuck with me a long ways as well. But like along the ways, Chris Haynes, he's with Yahoo. He's a great friend, like just somebody I, I always talk to and look for advice for. Um, I could go down the list of guys, but like those four or five are really unique and special to me just because of what they did for my career and how much they helped me along the way and explain things when they didn't have to. And they certainly don't need to. You know, and so I, like I said, I think just the time spent is the most special part about it because I got something that nobody else got to see. And it was something that really impacted me. And, you know, on the flip side, it had helped my career. You know, they shared some of the work that I did on them. They promoted some of the work that I did on them and it paid off. And uh, I, I think, you know, I didn't go into it thinking, oh, I'm going to get a bunch of followers from an article I did with Kristen Ledlow. But guess what? Here I am. And I did do, that did end up happening. But I think when you approach the mindset of I just want to do the best possible thing for that person or I want to do the best possible uh, piece, um, that will come. That will come, whether it's this piece or the next piece. One of them, it will work because people see hard work and they see the quality that you put in over time. Exactly. That's, 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 that's good. That's a great story right there. And that you just exemplified the main reason that mentors are a big reason in a lot of guys success and learning from the best, but can you talk a little bit and you hinted at a couple pieces there as well, kind of what, what do you think are kind of the tools in order to be successful in the field of sports journalism? You, you highlighted hard work, making sure the writing that goes out there, it's not only just to submit something, get it in and get it published, but you want to make sure that craft is the best that you can make it to be. So can you just talk a little bit about what tools do you see from your personal experience that um, are very valuable in the field of journalism that mostly would be successful? I mean, first of all, this is a relationship driven business. Exactly. Um, yep. People, people who say it's, it's driven by clicks or driven by, quotes or whatever. Well, in order to get quotes, in order to get something that's unique, you need to have relationships. And that starts with players, that starts with other media members, that starts with everybody. And, um, 
you know, I think treating everybody with a level of respect, whether you know them or not, is really important. And early in my career, you know, I, I made some mistakes. I called some people out I shouldn't have and done things like that. But for the most part, I treated everybody as if they were above me. You know, I wanted them to know that I was less important than them. And I know that sounds weird, but to me, you know, when you're asking somebody to take time out of their day, you better make sure that they're satisfied with whatever comes out of it. And um, so I would be the one usually driving the questions. I, you, I would be the one, you know, um, a- answering it in the best possible way or talking to them in, in the nicest possible light. Um, and I think that's that's what everything stems from. I mean, when I look at all my articles, it's like, okay, I sit here and I say, okay, the Kristen Ledlow one was great. I did one with Daryl Morey and the Rockets and that whole thing, and that blew up. And it's like, okay, what what changed in that? What 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 did I do that nobody else did? Well, I'm not a better writer than anybody. I can tell you that right now. I'm not very good at writing. I could have 500 students sit in my office and write the same story I wrote, if not better. But the difference between what I write and what somebody else writes is typically the uniqueness of what is inside of it. What I mean by that is the quotes, what you get from someone else. I mean, I look back and I sit here and I I think like the greatest example is uh, like Daniel Gibson. So I didn't really know Daniel Gibson um, until after he was retired. And one of his friends uh, introduced me and said, hey, you know, he's thinking about possibly doing an article with you. I sent him some articles. I showed him what I could do. We talked back and forth. We talked to his, you know, friend and essentially uh, set up an interview. And when we set up the interview, I had no idea what to expect. I'm like, look, I barely know this guy. But look, I put everything out on the table. I showed him that, you know, look, I'm not going to make this look bad on you. I want to make sure this comes out the right way. And so your genuine care for somebody is really important in this too. You need to understand that you're not going to, you can gain a relationship and burn it so much quicker than you can try and gain one. And so for me, it's like, I I, I have to tread lightly. You have to put the right pieces together and make the story meaningful, impactful, and worth it for the person that was doing it with you. So Daniel Gibson throws out so many bombs to me about, you know, just, uh, not committing suicide. Like he was, he was legitimately considering committing suicide at the end of his career. And so it's like, okay, I have this that nobody else has. How do I display this in the best way possible for him? Well, what did he do after, you know, how do you sum it up? Every, everything else, you put the piece together, but that's what separates it. Uh, Going back to what I was saying earlier, that's what separates it. It's, You have something that nobody else got, and that changes the game. And the the most important part about this that I can't stress enough for anybody that's trying to do this is you can't look for that. You can't try and grab it from somebody. You have to let them organically give it to you. It's not like I'm gleaming, I'm waiting for him to drop some bomb to me that I'm going to use against him or post in, a, in quotations and do this clickbaity article. That's not what I'm waiting for. I'm, I'm just letting him tell his story and I'm genuinely intrigued by his story. I want to learn about Daniel Gibson, the person. I want to know more about him. And that's what makes people want to give you stuff. That's what makes people feel trustworthy and comfortable talking to you. So for me... That's like the most important thing of it all is just the trust, honesty, integrity, and the way that you go about your business and build relationships is the absolute most important thing, the top, top shelf. Nothing competes with that. That's what you see all the great guys do. Why does Woj get all these news, news, uh, articles and stories and, uh, gets to break all this stuff? Well, because people trust Woj, right? That's why he gets it. He's built trust over time, over long periods of time, and worked his butt off to build and maintain these relationships, and that's why he gets the information he does. People think he just sits on his laurels. Maybe he does now, but when he was first in this business, there's no way. Agents wouldn't trust him. Management wouldn't trust him. Executives wouldn't trust him. So that's, I think, what you look at at sports in general – that's the common theme. That's the overriding theme of all these people and all the greats that do it 
is they can pull things out and get things that nobody else can get, and they're not trying or attempting to get it. They just genuinely care and have an interest in it, so much so that the people who are there interviewing feel comfortable. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I can't. Have, you you literally stressed it right there, and uh, right before the first thing you said is relationships are huge in this business, and I can't. Uh, I can't. I can't put in any better words. That's how it is. Especially, but both of us are in this field. We both know the importance of connections. And before we you even hopped on, when me and Doug were off air a little bit, we were talking about Woj and kind of his past. And uh, he was by me. He was right doing the Bergen record. Then he went up to the vertical. So I've seen his work over the years and i've seen that climb that he went from from the very beginning to where he is now and really and if there's not one person that could really exemplify the importance of connections especially in this field it's woge so but doug the floor is all yours yeah and i gotta also follow up with what you guys were saying connections are everything i mean when i wanted to start a pod i didn't want to just talk about the actual players and, you know, just interview players. I want to talk about the people behind it. People get you the quotes. People get you all this information. The people that build those connections. I thought that was more important. Like, I joked earlier, I'm like, if we rebranded, like, we're the people who interview the people who interview the people that you like or something along those lines. But <laughs> exactly. So anyways, um, when did you begin watching the NBA? Uh, first memory of the NBA and favorite team growing up and was covering the NBA dream and focus yours? Who? Uh, so the first memory I have of the NBA, um, probably like, so Portland's my hometown. That's where I'm from, raised. Um, and so Portland Trailblazers are like my early memories. Uh, I remember like the Vancouver Grizzlies coming to town a couple of times. Um, let's see here, boy. Uh, probably the earliest real memory that I have, I mean, of basketball in general is like Michael Jordan, like 96 era, give or take, um, and and just those Bulls teams. That's probably the first kind of iteration of my basketball watching experience. And then that developed obviously into, I would say, you know, Western conference finals, uh, Blazers, Lakers, 2001, um, that, that Sacramento Kings team with like, you know, your Chris Webbers, um, a lot of West coast teams. I mean, I, I do recall, I mean, later, uh, you know, 2006, seven, eight, nine, you know, wanting to watch like some of those Knicks teams and, um, you know, I even go down the list, man, there's a lot of different teams that I actually really, really enjoyed watching it. The Atlanta, Josh Smith, Al Horford iteration the Atlanta Hawks like that was one of my favorite teams like just watching um but in terms of like I mean real basketball memory I I know exactly where I was when the Western Conference Finals uh was going on when like Sean Elliott hits a game winner over the Trailblazers you know I was sitting in my grandmother's house with my family members we were all watching and having dinner and uh he hits that buzzer beater and it's like and the wind like just gets knocked out of the entire room and you just you, you see it. And, and, and that uh, I think those memories early on of just watching early Trailblazers games or just NBA games in general, it, it, you know, obviously influenced my passion for the game and, and my love for it. And after that, I mean, is, to the second part of your question, which was, um, you know, did I ever see myself covering the league or doing this. I I think I knew I wanted to be in sports. Um, I think anybody in high school or middle school would tell you that in a heartbeat. Um, I used to get my homework done. Like I I was a pretty good student. I didn't party a lot. I didn't smoke, drink, do any of that stuff. Um, And it wasn't because I wanted, like didn't want to or wanted to. There was just no desire on my end to actually do any of it. Um, And so I would get done with my homework in class. And then after class, I would go to like your stats pages, uh, YouTube and start watching like highlights of Kobe of you just name it. Any player, Damon Stoudemire was one of my favorite players growing up. Mighty mouse. Um, just cause I was small and, uh, you know, that was somebody I looked up to. Spud Webb was also somebody I looked up to just because those guys were smaller. Mike Bibby, another guy. And so I would just watch old highlights and clips of these guys along with, you know, Alan Iverson, And, um, that's really like my 
love and passion for the game is just that I wanted to get done with homework as quickly as possible so that I could cover, watch, you know, try and emulate. I mean, geez, I remember like er early in middle school getting the ace bandage, er elementary school even, getting the ace bandages. So I have eczema, FYI, going on a long tangent. Uh, but I have eczema oh, on my skin, and, and uh, as a kid, it used to get inside, like, in between, like, my arms, you know, early stages. And so, uh, Allen Iverson used to wear those ace bandages. I don't know if you remember, like, on his arm or on his legs. And so, I used to want to do that. So, I would go outside in the street, and I, I went to Fred Meyer. I saved up my money. My parents were always pretty hard on me about, like, saving your money, then go buy the thing that you want. So, I saved up my money. I go to the store. I buy this ace bandage. And I went to like four different stores to try and find this ace bandage, by the way, because they were all sold out because everybody wanted to be AI. And um, so I finally got one and I wore it and uh, it's like hot. It's kind of summertimey and uh, my eczema broke out. But I like every day after that, I would go out. I put the ace bandage on anyways. It's like, I don't care. Who cares? Eczema? Eh, whatever. Uh, I can wear this and like feel like Allen Iverson. And so. I think all in all, yes, I wanted to cover the NBA. I wanted to cover basketball in some way, shape, or form. That's that's part of, um, I think, who I am and kind of what I've developed into. And I, I just love sports. There's something that sports does that no other side of business does, no other entertainment does. And it gives the world and people, it brings people together, it it makes you cry. It makes you laugh. It makes you sad. It makes you happy. Like the range of emotions and just everything. It just is so unique from anything else that I've ever seen. And, um, it's something that I always really cherish and, and enjoy. Yeah. And then one thing that you were talking about in the early half of that was kind of the early memories of you in Portland. And one thing that comes to my mind immediately when I think of Portland, do you remember when Kobe Bryant hit the two shots I think one was a game winner, and then one was the send into overtime. I think it was April 2004, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah okay, you probably do. And then one thing I want to hit, I want to highlight, um, especially since most of our listeners are here on the East Coast in the New York, greater New York City area, can you just talk about kind of what basketball is in Portland? Because at least from the New York Knicks, Brooklyn Nets fan base, um, considering the Nets were New, New Jersey based in the very beginning, there, a lot of fans carried over to the Nets. If not, some said, okay, the Nets are out broken. We're going to go root for the Knicks. But I feel like Portland has kind of that really loyal fan base, especially what players have told me. And same thing with coaches and even other reporters I have covered the team. So can you even talk, can you just talk about the, kind of that vibe of uh, kind of in Portland with that team and that makeup, especially with the rush that they have currently? I mean, it was special. I mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, th that was the team that I fell in love with, I think, to begin with. You know, you talk about 04, it's a little past it, but, like, I love the Jailblazers, and they call them the Jailblazers. I hate that term. I hate the terminology. I talked to a lot of those players, you know, Bonzi Wells, Jermaine O'Neal, um, people who have been a part of those those teams in the past, and uh, they're just misunderstood, like, commonly misunderstood, and um, I think overall, like if you're talking about Portland and just the fan base and the team, there's um, there's something to be said about small market teams that just have like a a real passion for um, I, I, what I would say is probably the first team out of any team in in Oregon. You know, you look at um, we have the Portland Timbers, who's an MLS team. Uh, baseball's kind of like brewing, but other than that, I mean, really not much. And so Portland Trailblazers are really the number one thing here. And you look at like the fan base and what it means, win or lose, you know, to them is pretty incredible. And now it's interesting. So the, the, the thing about Portland that I find so intriguing, especially with their fans. So early on, they hated like just the, the Jailblazers were just hated. And I'd say about five to seven years after that time, you saw a real change in who the front office brought in. And I think it's it's mostly based on just the experience from the past. They wouldn't touch guys who had any sort of question marks surrounding them. And so you had this like just perfect team in, in a sense. You know, you had like your Nick Batum's, Brandon Roy's, LaMarcus Aldridge, all these guys that like were loved. They didn't do anything wrong. They gave back to communities. They did the right thing all the time. They were never caught doing anything. 
And so it's kind of trickled over to this new team. You know, you look in Portland with CJ and Dame as leaders, and it's like the fan base loves that. Almost, I would say, more than winning. And I know that sounds weird, but I think it's almost as important to this city to have players that they can get behind uh, culturally and personally as much as it is just to have a team that's winning. Now, obviously, a championship and that would – I'm sure all the fans would say they would want a championship. And, yes, that's probably true. But I think you know, second fiddle is having those guys who – just are the stand-up acts of the league. And I, I look at Dame and CJ, and they are that. You meet them in person, they are the nicest people. They take time out of their day for each individual. They spend time with other people. Um, they don't look for like PR out of it. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a little story, and I don't even know if I'm supposed to share this, but uh, so my grandmother was, um, she had like basically – a couple of strokes. And so we weren't sure, you know, what the situation was. And, uh, I reached out to CJ and asked him, you know, Hey, my grandmother's like favorite players, CJ, Dame, you know, just the Blazers in general, but CJ uh, right up there at the top. So I asked CJ, Hey, could you do this, you know, um, video to her just like say, Hey, happy birthday, whatever. And her birthday was coming up. I think was the, the, the occasion. And so he did this selfie video and I'm like, Hey, I'll post it out. I'll share, you know, thinking like the good PR, you know, he'll want some good PR. He's like, no, 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 no. You don't need to share it. Like, I just want to do it. Don't, don't share it. Like don't. And so it strikes me as somebody who just genuinely cares, right? They're not doing it for anything. They're doing it to help somebody or to make somebody feel good. And so that I think is what the Portland fan base looks for. And I think that's what they have right now with these guys. And I just hope at some point, We can live to see the day where these guys that are beloved by their small market teams, you look at Giannis, the same thing, find a way to win a championship for their their respective cities because I don't think there's been something like that for a very long time. I mean, the last one I look at is LeBron, but he still left and came back. I just can't wait for the time where the guy that's drafted by the team wins the championship with that team and is the stand-up guy that we all talk about because that moment – that that's worth three championships in my mind. No, I definitely, can, I feel can't that agree with entirely. That. I can't agree with that. That's the first off. That's a great story from that you mentioned about CJ. That was a great story, and I can't agree more about that small market terminology because when you think about it, the Warriors, yeah, they drafted. They had a great draft. They had a, a great kind of draft history, which led to a dynasty. But you think about like even going back, like you said, there was the Spurs. There were a couple other like small marketish teams, I guess, in the NBA standpoint, Detroit sticks out back in the mid 2000s. But like you said, we don't know if there's going to be Giannis is kind of that lone soldier as of now that that guy that got drafted with that team can bring a small market a championship to the small market. So I agree with that. But um, and then the, kind of the next question to transition a little bit is the position is positionless. So yeah. when did you begin to host uh, Positionless, and what was your inspiration behind launching it? Uh, this is about two years ago. Um, well, actually, the inspiration behind it was, uh, so Dylan Brooks, um, which is, he, he's been in the news lately, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Dylan Brooks of the Memphis Grizzlies, who, who played at University of Oregon, who I followed and covered for a very long time, um, is uh, somebody that was Positionless. And um, before he announced his decision to go to the NBA draft, we came up with this concept of like, okay, we're going to make this website. It's going to be like Players Tribune kind of, but like players can pen their own articles and write their own stuff and do their own videos and everything else. So we called it Positionless. And it was based off Dylan, you know, being positionless. But then also like in walks of life, you have to be positionless. Like I was thinking about it. Like um, you can't, you can't be stuck in a box. Nobody likes the person who just has the one mindset. Um, you got to be able to do more than one thing. You, you have to be more usable than that. And in this, in this day and age, it's more evident than ever that you have to be able to use multiple things and be good at multiple things. Um, and so I think that's just kind of a telling thing. That's, that's where the inspiration came from is this website. And we had him announce him going to the NBA draft on the website 
And, um, and then the, the, you know, the website kind of went away after a while. We just kind of stopped updating it. Everybody got busy and, uh, that was that, but positionless always stuck with me cause I just love the terminology and I, I love the name of it. So I came up with the idea and the concept and really what it was about is just telling the stories that nobody really dives deep in, you know? Um, and it wasn't necessarily like, Oh, we're going to talk about the thing that you've never talked about in your career before. It was more just like, how the heck do people get to where they are? And like, I find that really intriguing NBA players otherwise. And you can read it in my writing all the time from guys like Myers Leonard to Jamel Hill, to Michael Smith, to whoever, um, all the articles that I've done and stories that I've done on people, it's all about the background. It's about how the heck did this start? I mean, that's how the big three started. That's, that's how I got involved in the big three to begin with was I did a story about how the big three came to be. So that that's how the podcast started. And I interviewed, uh, I think one of my first guests was Jamel Hill. Uh, who else did I have? Uh, David Griffin. Um, I've had a bunch of different guests. I mean, like uh, over time, just, just uh, you know, different people. And um, everyone is different, you know, and uh, that's what I love about doing it. And I, I'm going to continue to do it. The big three is kind of, uh, put at, put on as like the presenting host at this point with Ball's Life on there. And so um, together we kind of put that out. And uh, the next one with Jason Terry is really, really good. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. But yeah, we've had, you know, I had Mark Cuban last week and everybody saw the Mark Cuban video on YouTube, but um, that's just like an audio portion of it. And so it'll evolve and change over time. But yeah, I love talking. I love getting to know somebody. And um know their story and know how they got to where they are. And so that, that's kind of the, the purpose of the podcast and the inspiration behind it. That's great. Sure. Yeah. Like, like Doug said earlier, that's the reason that Doug wanted to kind of launch this was to find out everyone knows who X is in the reporting field, but they don't know their backstory. They don't know kind of the hustle that they had to do in order to get to the point where they are today. Kind of like the gist that we went through earlier with you. So we can definitely kind of relate on that aspect. A lot of podcasts kind of follow that same format because that's what really gets uh, people interested. And I know a lot of people are interested about that. And to kind of stay on the, the topic of your own podcast, um, who are some of your kind of favorite guests to interview or bring on the podcast? We're not trying to stir any beef or anything like that. <laughs> but who, who are some of those guys that kind of really stuck out to you? Um, well, I had ice cube on and cube is just, um, he's, a character. he's just, he's, he's great. You know, I just, I just yeah. love talking to him. He's just so interesting and unique. Um, uh, I think one of the more interesting ones that I had was, uh, George Sedano of ESPN. Um, he has a really interesting story and really interesting background and kind of went into the D Wade relationship with him and his family. Um, my, actually my first episode was Bonzi Wells and that was just, I mean, me being, you know, growing up in that era that he played in, you know, it was just kind of surreal to go and walk through that again. And then to also hear his side of things, which was entirely different from what you saw displayed in the media. Um, I mean, everybody, I mean, I've had Malik Henry, the guy who was like the star quarterback at last chance. You Mike Conley was really unique and interesting. Uh, him and me actually have like a kind of a tie in. Cause I, I know Greg Oden pretty well. And Greg Oden's like best friend and I used to work together at Adidas when I was just out of high school, uh, working retail. So like there's all sorts of interesting tie-ins to that and it, and it was really fun. And then I also had, um, uh, Eric McCollum, CJ's brother and Romeo Travis, who they both like grew up in Ohio. And so like having both of them on and like explaining the dynamics was really fun because they're both overseas hoopers and they both have really good friends or brothers, uh, LeBron James and CJ McCollum, uh, that are in the NBA and like striving and doing so well. So there's like so many like interesting kind of ways you can go with that. So there, there's a lot of them. I mean, I, I can go down the list. Sham, Sharania, very interesting. Corey Maggetti, uh, Cassidy Hubbard of ESPN. I love her. I love what she does. Um, Alex English, uh, Nuggets legend. Just to, uh, you know, I think my favorite though, like I, I'll be honest, I I wanted to interview Mahmoud Abdul Roof for probably three years, and um, mm -hmm. I just never had the opportunity. Like I, I I had either missed him or we had scheduled it, it just didn't work out. And like that interview meant so much to me because I love I, his story is just so different, 
and his mentality and mindset is just very unique and very different from almost anybody I've ever met. And so to hear him talk about it and talk about what he does and how he keeps his body right, uh, that, that, that was really fun. That's great. That's it. That's and it. I think that's a perfect way to transition to the next topic. So now let's talk about the big three, a.k.a. Fireball three. So when did you first become part of the league? And uh, what have you enjoyed the most so far? Oh, man. Uh, I know it's a I lot. Became, I became a part of the league um, in season one, actually. Uh, I got a press release saying that they – it was on embargo, I think. But essentially, it was just a press release saying that they were going to announce a three-on-three league. And so I was really intrigued. Um, and the names obviously mentioned were high-level names, Kenya Martin – uh, Allen Iverson, just a bunch of like marquee guys that I grew up watching or, or loved. And so I was all in and I hit up the guy who sent me the press release and I said, Hey, uh, it, you know, any interest in a story? Like, what are you guys looking for? What do you guys want? You know, just very interested, had questions. And he's like, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of opportunities, you know, blah, blah, blah. What, what would you want to do? And I said, well, how did this lead? How does this thing start? And he says, well, I, I don't really know. I'm like, okay, well, let's, uh, if that works, I'd love to talk with Cube and Jeff and the guys who started it and get an idea. So that's how it started. I did a story on them, and um, I, I would uh, humbly say that it blew up. Um, it was on ESPN, and I went on a couple of shows to talk about it. Uh, I think I went on Jim Rome to talk about it at one point. I don't know. Anyways, um, I went on a lot of shows to talk about that story, and uh it was just something that I had a passion for. And when I started talking about it more and, and learning about it more and getting more involved, it just was something that I wanted to be a part of in any way, shape or form. So they called me early in season one to help them out with some like script writing of some shows. They were doing like some post game shows, pre game shows, and I'd never done it before. I'm just like, yeah, well, I've seen a bunch of basketball shows. I know basketball. I know the players. And they're like, okay, let's let's fly you out. Let's do this. And so I flew out. And, you know, at first it really wasn't a paid thing. It was just kind of like I wanted to do it. You know, I, I didn't ask for anything. I didn't want to. And that's how I am. That's who I am. I'm not really somebody who's going to be like, no, I'm not doing it for I need I need 10,000 bucks or I need this or I need that. I, I just don't. Uh, the hurdles I never present them. I just think, what is it? What's in it for them? And for myself, what is this experience going to look like? And so I just took with, took it and ran with it. Um, that ended up turning into a podcast for them and some writing on the website. And then this past season, I just did a bunch of PR stuff. And thankfully, they were happy enough with what I did that uh, they hired me full time. And I've been pushing out content obviously you'll you'll see on our social media um it's it's a little more active than typical typical um off-season stuff that we've done and uh, we're doing a lot of unique video content just like in-depth like profiles on players and so yeah i mean for me uh this league is everything i mean this is this is what i um, and maybe not exactly what I initially dreamed of, but this is exactly what I want to do. And uh, people say like, oh, there's there's always got to be something else that you want to do. There's always got to be something you got to aspire to be. I'm like, no, I, 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 I thoroughly enjoy doing this. This league is um, uh, apart from my family, like my second home and my second family. Um, that that's 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 why I do it. That's why I love it. That's why I did it for free. That's why I. <laughs> continue to do this sort of thing. So I, I, I just love this league. I love what Cube and Jeff put together. I love working for them. I like who they are as people, what they stand for. There's a lot more to it than just basketball in this league, but um, all of it is just, uh, it's gravy for me, man. I, I, I won't take any day for granted. It's just something I really enjoy and thoroughly love doing. Yeah, That's no, great. I mean, seeing it, I mean, as you know, I've been to, well, I've been to two games specifically, I went to the first game at Barclays Center, and then I went to the one where uh, uh, the previous season just began with uh, Joe Johnson hitting that beautiful, beautiful, oh, beautiful yeah. four-point shot to oh, ice yeah. the game. I saw Joe, Joey Clutch, Joe Jesus, whatever you want to call him. So, I mean, it's it's been fun. I, I mean, I wish I could watch it as like religiously as I do the Nets, but honestly, it's going to just keep getting bigger. 
Um, so basically, how would you compare thus far and compare and contrast rather covering the big three to the NBA? Whew. Um, you know, the big three gives you access that nobody else really gets. I mean, as a media member, I was so stoked to find out just like how easy it was not to not necessarily to get interviews and things like that. I didn't really care for that at, at first. It was more just like the players genuinely want to talk to people. They want to um, see this league grow and improve. And that, I think, is the most important aspect of it. You know, um, players in the NBA are pulled in so many different directions. They have so many people, middlemen, and people telling them how to do things or what to do or what not to do. And with this, it's just it, – it feels so family-oriented. If they know you, you're in. You, that's it. You know, they, they love you. They, they'll, 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 they'll like you like your family. And so, um, you know, I always say hi to all of them. I have fun with them. It's just – um, it's very different. You know, I, I don't really, and I can't present it really fully unbiased opinion because obviously as an NBA media member, you are given access and that's what you're given with the big three. I, I worked for the league, you know, it's not like I worked for the NBA. So the access is a little bit different, I guess, on my end. Um, but I would say even for media members, it's different. You know, you get a chance to see players, um, Basically, I mean, if you want to talk to somebody, we're going to try and find a way to make it happen. And uh, that's not necessarily the case with the NBA. And I think, you know, they're in a different limelight. They've got a different situation. But uh, that's probably the biggest difference is just the access. And then on top of it, um, I, I would say the unique aspects of just – I think more or less the way the players are, they, the, the way they act, you know, um, they're just different. They, they're from an old school style. They, they speak their, their minds, you know, they, they speak what they want to speak. You know, there have been multiple times where Reggie Evans or someone like that has sat on the podium and in an interview and somebody has asked a question that they thought was dumb. And they said, no, I'm not answering that. Or you're, you know, this is that, you know? And um, so I think, really it's it's just different and it's fun it's fun to be a part of it's fun to be around it's it's fun to be around all these players and to kind of know their stories and see their families and it's just different it's it's very different i would say more than anything it's much more family friendly um and it's something that i think everybody can understand and watch either closely or from afar and see yeah no definitely i as I mentioned, it's it's very therapeutic to see what the league has brought together, not just from a fan perspective, but a player perspective, and even the coaches. Like every part about it, like that family culture, as you mentioned, is is visible, not just to the players and to you and some people in the league. Like to the fans, you see that. That's what I wanted to be around it. Like I, I didn't, I'm a late gen NBA fan, but to have guys like. Alan Anderson, Reggie Evans, now Joe Johnson, like it really resonated with me. It's like everyone gets a piece of their own NBA history put into a league. And maybe it's my histor history major bias. It just feels so good. But anyways, yeah. yeah. No, and to see them back on the court, I think is just like, like you said, therapeutic. Like, you know that they're doing okay. I mean, I saw the videos just like everybody did, I think. And I hate to even bring it up because I don't want to, but the yeah. videos of Delonte West or, you know, some of the other players that have have not given, been given a chance, not not been helped. And I think you look at this, and this is what it is for them. They, like, uh, these players, a lot of them, um, you know, they don't have like, <laughs> Cube says it all the time, but like, imagine you're thirty or thirty one. And the job that you've done your entire life and trained your entire life for, they come to you and they say, no, nah, you're done. No, no, you can't do that anymore. And it's just like a flip of a switch. And I think it's just, it's, it's very mentally tasking on these guys. And I think that's what I think is so special about it is you see these guys with real joy and happiness and even like guys like Joe Johnson, who he thinks he should be in the NBA, and I absolutely I agree, but to see him out there and enjoying it and having fun with it, and that just 
it just resonates and I think people see it and um, that that's I think what makes this league unique and special and you said it best you know it is like a piece of basketball history through the past 30 or so years I mean you've got coaches like Charles Oakley and Gary Payton and Lisa Leslie and people you've seen grow up and you know you talk about and, and sadly you talk about Kobe Bryant and, and this tragic death and passing and it's like I look at Kobe and I, I look at some of these people and I'm like, I'm so thankful that I got to see more of them, you know? And uh, it's really saddening to think about Kobe, obviously, but I think uh, of all these players and people that we we got to see more of their story and more of their life. And uh, I don't think that's necessarily the case or was the case before it. No, of course. I mean, I speaking of Kobe, I, I hope there's some kind of tribute from the big three. I know it's going to be so far removed uh, in the calendar year, but knowing not that I know Ice Cube like you do, but I do feel that he'll do something, you know, pretty special. Uh, yeah, I would assume something would be done. I don't know what that is right now. That's of kind of a cube call. But I think, you know, you mentioned uh, knowing Cube, you know, everybody kind of knows Cube. And, uh, that, that's kind of what makes him unique. You know, he speaks his mind yeah, and no. every interview is a little bit different and every show he's on is a little bit different. Every time I speak to him, he's a little bit different and that's what makes him cube. He's, he, uh, ice cube is refreshing. It, it, it every time <laughs> it's something different. And, and I, I like that, you know, and that that's, I think Jeff and cube both, they're visionaries. They're people who put this thing together and, and came up with the concept and um you know it's funny because you look at ice cubes resume and it's just like okay uh it's check 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 like i could go down the list of like movies and music and album sales and whatever else you want to talk into that um hollywood star fame whatever and you just go, go through it um but this is his baby right now and i think i think it's important to um know that he's very invested in it and uh that that's that's what makes this league operate so well is his passion for it is what makes this special uh it, it's what makes these rule changes happen um and that 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 is something that i don't think uh any other startup league really has is somebody like that who's putting every ounce of their energy and time uh into making this thing the best it can possibly be yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you've definitely covered the question with Cube of ownership, governorship, or whatever you want to call it. He's not someone just as a, as a hobby, like it's bigger than just basketball for him. So I love to see it. So transitioning to another guy in the league, what's your favorite uh, Michael Rappaport story? I'm sure there's <laughs> several, but like what is you think is appropriate, shareable, you know? Oh, man. Mike is, uh, Mike is funny. Um, you know, I think off camera and off air and things like that, I think he's, he's pretty similar to what he is. Um, you know, I, I spent three days with him, uh, recently he had a comedy tour here in Portland and I helped him with some PR and whatnot, just like getting him on shows or escorting him to places or whatever. And, um, He's just, he's different, man. I mean, he's, he, I, I, I don't know if I have one particular story. Um, I, well, actually I, I do. And people probably know of this one. I posted about it a while ago though. I was doing a podcast with Scalambrini in, uh, one of the locker rooms in big three and Mike just like jumped in, stormed in and started yelling and, and Scalambrini like ended the podcast was like, I can't do this with this guy in here. Like, but, and, and they just went back and forth and, you know, there's F bombs and whatever being thrown around, but like those two get them in a room together and it's like something just, I don't know. They, they're, they're, they're like the same, but they're different. And, uh, they always get into, get into it. And whether it's jokingly or not, it's just funny to watch. But, um, yeah, I was, I was at a comedy tour here with Portland and with, with him here in Portland. Um, I think most recently it's funny cause you hear him, he's like, yeah, Oliver, what do you want? What, what time? You know, this, that, or the other. You know, he like has this like kind of aura about him or whatever. And uh, I called him for something. I can't remember what it was. And he's like, so what do you want? Why, why, why are you calling? And it, is, it just sounded so much like what his podcast is. And I was like, what the? I haven't heard this side of Mike before. But um, Mike is different, man. Mike is funny. He, uh, you know, he, he puts on a show whenever he's around people that he knows he needs to put on a show for. And um, he's just naturally gifted 
what I think is special about him and what makes him just so different from a lot of people that I've ever met is like he makes almost anybody laugh and he can change like actually here's a story I'll, I'll go back a little bit we were I was writing scripts and doing this whole thing and we were doing the show and we said hey Mike we le- we need like five minutes with these like okay okay I got five minutes so I said you need to talk about this this and this here's some note cards he says no I don't need the note cards I don't need the note cards and I said you don't need like what do you mean and he just went on this th- this thing, improv, for like 10 minutes, exactly what I wanted without me ever having to hand him a script, a note, uh, anything. I just told him kind of what we wanted to talk about generally, and he just did it. And it was like, I, there's just not many people you can just say, hey, I want you to do this, this, and this, and it just comes out perfectly. And boom, that's Mike. Uh, so I think that's the story that I, I, I remember Mike by most or know Mike by most is that just because he is very talented and I don't think people understand it because he always takes shots at people and <laughs> yeah. talks smack and, and wants to get in stuff like that, but he enjoys it. You know, that that's, that's New York. You guys are from there. Like that's New York attitude. Like that's part of the culture. That's part of what oh. you do. You make fun of people. He enjoys it. He has fun with it. He's not like. He's, this is not like murderous or like crazy malicious yeah malicious stuff here we're not talking like he's gonna go after somebody he's just having fun and joking around about it and i think that's what people don't really fully grasp and understand but um yeah that story kind of emulates or, or talks about really what what he is as a, a, a as an actor and a comedian and i think that's what just makes him so special and that's why he's on all the shows he's on atypical and all the different things he's doing with his podcast and comedy tour and whatnot. He just, man, he comes up with stuff. And I'll even tell you, like when I was in this comedy tour thing with him, he was taking bits and pieces from all of our conversations, the interviews that he had, he was taking bits and pieces and he would use it in his comedy shows. And I was like, this is, this is next level, man. Like I, I I understand people have to tailor it to each audience and whatnot, but the way that he did it was just flawless. Like you would never know that he just got that information four hours ago, but he went up on stage and acted like he'd had it for years. And that just doesn't, doesn't, I've not seen a comedy person do that. And I, I, you know, obviously I haven't been behind the scenes very often, but to see it, it's just crazy, man. It's, it's special. You know, you're watching somebody who has a gift. No, definitely. I mean, he's he's definitely a character. That's like <laughs> the cleanest way I'll put it. Um, he 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 does proud of me sometimes. Not that it's directly, but sometimes it's just like, come on, man, really. But <laughs> I, at the end of the day, I will laugh. I will laugh. Um, maybe it's because my Nets bias with the whole Knicks uh, clean up on aisle, you know, with his dog and the Knicks hat kind of thing. I'm not going to go into detail with that. His uh, pr- way of expressing himself with the Knicks is. I think makes up for it at times, but also even his political things. But let's not deep dive into that. But anyways, <laughs> uh, last question. Do you think the big three creates a sister league in the near future? Ice Cube. Uh, that's your call, bud. Uh, Jeff and Cube. Um, I don't know. You know, that's a great question. I, th- I think there's an opportunity here where, I mean, they've talked about it before, but like I really see an opportunity where we would do some worldwide stuff or like maybe a – uh, side, you know, maybe a world league or, um, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just, please do not take this and run with it or use it. Anyway. I know that that <laughs> yeah. hasn't happened very often with me, but every once in a while I've seen little clips and highlights where I'm like, yo, I, I didn't mean it this way. And, um, but, but really that, that's what I see. If it's going to be, it's going to be something like that where it's like a big three Brazil or big three Australia or big three London or something like that. Or maybe it just starts by us, going to those places and then, you know, venturing off into that. I don't, I don't know. But to me that, that seems like the most, uh, palpable thing at the moment. Um, not to say that it would ever happen. I just know that they have talked about that sort of thing way in the future. And, um, you know, it all really comes down to, uh, the success of this league. You know, I know it's grown. I know it's improved. I know it's gotten better, but it still needs to get better. We still need to have more fan support. We still need to have more people watching. And that can't be stressed enough. And and that's part of my job. My job is to make sure that players do the, the things that they need to do that um, 
they do the interviews right, that we talk about the league in the right ways, but also, you know, they have fun with it and people understand that and, and they're interested in it and to create an interest and generate that. And so, um, you know, I, I, I take it on as a task. I enjoy it. But ultimately, this league needs to continue to grow and improve each and every year for us to be able to have sister leagues and things of that nature. But I, I can see it in the future for sure. That's awesome. Well, if if anything, we had to say you heard it first. But, you know, we'll, we'll wait on it. Yeah, you heard it first, like the dunk contest news that I've been dropping the past like week and a half, and yet nobody's giving me credit <laughs> for. Goodness. For it's a clout-filled era. There you go. Everybody wants That's theirs. It. That's it. Well, we'll leave it right there. But, Oliver, <laughs> thanks a lot for joining me and Doug tonight. We really appreciate taking your time out of your night to talk to Doug and I. And let me tell you, it was really fun talking to you. Hey, I appreciate you guys having me on, and I appreciate the interest. And, uh, hey, when we're out in New York – Maybe it's this season, I don't know, or where we're near it. Hit me up and let's uh, let's get you to a big three game. Oh, definitely. Sounds man. like a plan to me. I look forward to going back. Well, Chris, would you like to give the close remarks? Yeah, you got it. So remember, guys, feel free to email over any suggestions, questions, comments, or thoughts on any of our content by sending an email to wingspanpodcast at gmail.com. And do not forget to follow us on our Twitter and Instagram accounts. And remember to subscribe to our podcast on your preferred listening device or well service as for next time stay classy and take care